guys, Wells Knight here, and welcome back to Magic the Gathering Arena. Hope you guys are having an awesome day. I'm having a fantastic day. Now that Innistrad Midnight Hunt is out, I wanted to do a video explaining all of the various abilities in Arena, because I know there are a lot of people on my channel who are new to Magic. Uh, so, this video is going to cover essentially every special ability. Uh, like, for example, you see here this card has lifelink and modular. What the heck does that mean? Well, you're going to find out. Uh, as for the abilities we're going to cover, we're only going to talk about the stuff that is in standard, uh, which would be the five to eight most recent sets that have been released and that rotates once a year. We're not going to be talking about the stuff in historic, which is every set that has ever been released since Magic the Gathering Arena came out, because to be honest, if we covered historic, this video would be like two hours long. So I'm just going to do the stuff in standard, and that's why I wanted to wait for Midnight Hunt to release before I did this video. Uh, so without further ado, let's go ahead and just jump straight into it. I'm going to cover the evergreen abilities first. Those are abilities that will appear in every single set and that aren't uh, unique to the set that, they're com that, uh, that the creature or the whatever card it's in is from. So the first one is Death Touch, and Death Touch is pretty straightforward. Um, you can see there's a lot of creatures that will have this, and basically any amount of damage that this creature deals to another creature is enough to kill it. So if this hired po this hired poisoner that's a 1-1 does one point of damage to an enemy's 6-6 six, six creature, the 6-6 six, six creature will still die. That's Death Touch. Next up is Defender, and uh, basically that's also very straightforward. A creature with Defender cannot attack, it can only block. Uh, next up is Double Strike and First Strike, and these go hand in hand, um, and th this is one that confuses a lot of newer players, but it's pretty straightforward once you understand that during the combat phase, during the damage step, there are actually two separate damage steps. There is first strike damage that happens, and then after first strike damage happens, normal damage happens. And if no creature in the combat uh, has first strike or double strike, then you just ignore the first strike damage phase. So a creature with first strike will deal damage during the first strike damage phase. So basically they'll do their damage before the other creature has a chance to. And a creature with double strike will do damage during both. They will do damage during both the first strike damage phase and the double strike damage phase. You know what? Let's actually just change this to standard. So we'll only see stuff that's actually in standard here. Uh, so for example, say this um, gloom... well, no, that's not a good example. Let's say this blink dog, this 1-1, one, one, which has double strike, uh, is fighting uh, another 1-1. One, one. Just a normal 1-1 one, one that, say, doesn't have any abilities. Uh, and basically what would happen is the blink dog would deal damage first during first strike, the other creature would not get a chance to. Pretty straightforward. Uh, if it had first strike, same thing would happen. Now, if two creatures that have first strike or double strike fight, they will deal their damage simultaneously. So if this uh, Blink Dog and this Core Blade, this Core Blade Master here were to fight, they would kill each other because they're both able to deal damage during their first strike damage phase, and they're both one ones. So they would wipe each other out. And that's first strike, double strike in a nutshell. They go hand in hand. First strike you deal damage during the first strike battle phase. Uh, double strike, you deal damage during both the first strike and regular damage phase. So that's that's first strike and double strike. Next up is flash. And flash means that you can cast the spell at instant speed. So a creature with flash you can play during your opponent's turn. Uh, it's great for ambushing opposing creatures. They declare attacks. You flash in something that can block and you surprise them or uh, certain enchantments might have flash as well, like Howl of the Hunt here. You can flash it in, and uh, it's an enchantment that can buff up one of your creatures. Um, basically, flash just means you can play the card at instant speed, even though it's a card type that normally would not be able to. Uh, next, we have flying, and flying is, again, very straightforward. A creature with flying can only be blocked by another creature with flying, uh, or a creature with reach. We'll talk about reach later. 
So it can basically fly over your opponent's creatures and get in for damage uh, unless they have uh, a flyer of their own. Then we have haste, and haste creatures do not suffer from summoning sickness, so they can attack or use tap abilities on the turn that they enter the battlefield. After that, we have hexproof. Uh, and Hexproof means that a creature with Hexproof cannot be targeted by uh, spells or abilities your opponents control. So they cannot uh, say, hey, I'm playing this card and killing, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to uh, shock your creature and kill it or whatever. Uh, it can't be targeted by your opponent. However, it should be mentioned that uh, it does not protect against effects that don't target. So, for example... If your opponent plays Doomscar, which says destroy all creatures, it would still kill a creature with Hexproof because it's not targeting that creature, it's destroying everything. So untargeted removal, like board wipes or sacrifice things that say your opponent has to sacrifice a, a creature or whatever, stuff like that is not, uh, Hexproof doesn't protect from that type of stuff. Next up we have Indestructible. Indestructible. There we go. Uh, and indestructible means that the creature does not die from destroy effects. So, for example, if we have um, something like Infernal Grasp that says destroy target creature, uh, a creature with indestructible would not be killed by that. Uh, it also gives you immunity from death touch because death touch is a destroy effect. So if a creature with indestructible takes damage from a death touch creature, it will still not die. Uh, however, it, it the, the thing that often throws new players off about this is minus X minus X effects like flunk, for example. So... It gets kind of complicated, but think of toughness in terms of, like, health points from video games, right? Deal damage, the the words deal damage, like, if you look at, uh, oh, we actually don't have shock. Okay, uh, Moon Rager. Uh, like this card right here that says Moon Rager slash deals three damage. A card that says deal damage reduces a creature's current HP if you think of toughness as HP, right? So, like, uh, this Clarion Spirit would have 2 HP, and a deal damage effect would deal 2 damage to it. However, minus X effects, like Flunk, for example, uh, reduce the creature's maximum HP, rather than actually dealing damage to them. So, if you were to give Clarion Spirit minus 2, minus 2, it would then have zero maximum HP, so it would essentially just cease to exist, which means that a creature with indestructible can still be killed by minus X minus X effects. So if you if they're hit with something your opponent controls that um, that reduces their toughness rather than actually dealing damage to them, they will still die. Toski would still die from a minus X minus X effects, and that's one reason that minus X effects are so powerful, is they can get around indestructible creatures. Uh, so, there's a couple examples. If your opponent has like a 3 3 indestructible creature and you cast uh, Crippling Fear, right? It gets minus 3 minus 3, therefore, its maximum toughness becomes zero and it ceases to exist because its max HP is reduced to zero. Now, on the other hand, if your opponent has, say, a 5-5 five five and you cast Crippling Fear, it then essentially becomes a 2-2 two two indestructible creature. So if you cast something like Shock to deal two damage to it, it's then a 2-2 two two indestructible creature that's taken two damage, which does not kill it because it's indestructible and can't die from damage. So that's kind of, I know it's kind of a long-winded explanation, but... Uh, especially with the, the way that Arena displays damage, this is one of those things that really throws new players for a loop. So just basically keep in mind that uh, uh, indestructible creatures are affected by minus X, minus X effects like Crippling Fear, but are not affected by damage effects like Moonrager Slash. 
Next, we have Lifelink, and Lifelink is, uh, again, very straightforward. A creature with Lifelink, any damage it deals, you gain that much health. You gain that much life. So if a 2-2 Lifelinker hits your opponent, you gain 2 life. If a 2-2 Lifelinker hits an opponent's creature, you gain 2 life, etc., etc. Next, we have Menace, and Menace means that a creature can only be blocked by two or more creatures at once. So if you have a Shady Traveler on the field and your opponent has one creature, they can't block it uh, because you need two creatures to block a creature with Menace or two or more. They can, you know, if you're setting up uh, double, triple blocks, whatever, to try and maybe take out one of your opponent's bigger creatures or something like that, uh, you can block a Menace creature with three or four blockers if you really want to, but it can't be blocked by one uh, single blocker by itself. Next, we have protection from fill in the blank. And I don't know if this is technically an evergreen ability, but it does show up fairly frequently. So I'm going to call it an evergreen ability, even though I don't think it technically is. Uh, but if we look at some of these cards, protection from god creatures, protection from werewolves. If we get out of standard and we look at historic, uh, there's even more. You'll have stuff like... Uh, Archon of Absolution that says protection from white, protection from humans. What the heck is protection? Well, a, pr uh, a creature that has protection from something cannot be damaged, enchanted or equipped, blocked, or targeted by spells of whatever type they are protected from, including your own spells. It does not provide immunity from untargeted non-damage effects like Doomscar, that would say, you know, destroy all, uh, or Crippling Fear that says all creatures get minus X, minus X. Um, so basically this Archon that has protection from white could not be destroyed. Uh, it can't be blocked by, say, uh, Sigrid Godflavor. God favored. It wouldn't take it. You can still block it and it wouldn't take damage. Um, there's all sorts of stuff. But basically there is an acronym to remember it. Damaged. Enchanted Equipped, Blocked, or Targeted for uh, DET is the acronym, D-E-B-T, Damaged, Equipped, uh, Enchanted, Blocked, or Targeted. So just basically keep in mind it's protected from things of whatever it says it's protected from, werewolves, a color, whatever, um, but it is still vulnerable to uh, untargeted removal like Doomscar, uh, Exile Effects, uh, things like that. Uh, oh, also I should mention... Uh, indestructible creatures are also vulnerable to exile effects as well, uh, like Baffling End or um, what's the new one? Baffling End or Borrowed Time that say exile. That doesn't destroy. That exiles. So that would also hit uh, both indestructible creatures and things that, well, I suppose Borrowed Time wouldn't because it's an enchantment, but uh, you get the idea. Next we have Reach. Reach is kind of, uh, goes along with flying. It's primarily going to be on green creatures. And basically, a creature with Reach can block a creature with flying. Uh, it doesn't have flying itself, so it can still be blocked by normal creatures. Uh, but it is able to block flyers. That's what Reach means. Next we have Trample. Trample is uh, an ability that basically says any excess damage you deal to an opponent's creature is dealt uh, as damage to your opponent's life. So if a 5-4 Trampler attacks a 2-2 Hailstorm Valkyrie, it does three extra damage and your opponent would therefore take the extra damage so they would lose three life if, uh, if the Hailstorm Valkyrie blocks the Mountain Dread Knight. Hope that makes sense. Next, we have Vigilance, and Vigilance means that an opponent uh, or a creature with Vigilance does not tap when it attacks. So you can attack, essentially attack and block on the same turn cycle. Uh, also gets around certain effects that might say like exiled target tapped creature or uh, something along those lines. So basically a creature with Vigilance doesn't tap when it uh, is when it attacks. Uh, then we have Ward, and this is, I believe, the newest evergreen keyword, and Ward just says, in order for your opponent to target a thing with Ward, they have to pay the Ward cost. 
uh, to do that. So, for example, this Rhyme Shield Frost Giant has Ward 3, so if your opponent were to target the Frost Giant with something, they would have to pay a th an extra 3 mana to do so. Or you could look at something like uh, Westgate Regent here, where the ward cost is discard a card. So if your opponent wants to target the Westgate Regent with an effect, they have to discard a card to do it. And it's important to note that they have to pay the discard cost and then their thing happens. So what you can do is basically wait for them to pay the card and then if you have some sort of a response to it, uh, you can take advantage of that. Okay, so those are the evergreen keywords. Those are the ones that you will see in basically every set going forward. Uh, now let's get into the set-specific stuff, and we'll look at Kicker first from Zendikar. This is, again, not an evergreen keyword, but it's a fairly common one. You do It has been in previous sets. I forget exactly which ones. Ixalan, maybe? Um, so it's a returning keyword, but basically Kicker means that you can pay an extra cost when you cast the spell, and then you get some sort of additional effect. So like this spell shield, for example, it's normally one blue, but you can pay an extra one to give uh, the creature that you're casting it on hexproof as well. Or uh, Blood Chief's Thirst, it's one black mana to destroy a target creature or planeswalker with mana value two or less, but if you pay an additional two generic and a black, you can destroy any target creature or planeswalker, not just one with mana value two. So that's basically Kicker in a nutshell. Pay an extra cost, get an additional effect, or an upgraded effect, depending on the card. Next we have Landfall. And Landfall is uh, whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, something happens. So Felidar Retreat, this enchantment, whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you can create a, a cat token, or you can put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control. Uh, Lotus Cobra, when a land enters the battlefield under your control, add one mana of any color. When a land enters the battlefield under your control, each opponent mills three cards, etc., etc. Basically, as I said, whenever you play a land or put a land onto the battlefield somehow, some sort of effect triggers. That's landfall. Moving on to Kaldheim, we have Boast, and Boast is an ability that says when this creature has attacked on this turn, uh, you can pay the Boast cost and trigger some sort of effect. So after it has been declared on uh, as an attacker, and it, I should mention, it does not have to be before combat is over. It, you can it, it, combat does not have to have actually finished in order for you to take advantage of boast. As soon as they are declared as an attacker, that's when you can uh, cast. Excuse me. That's when you can activate the boast ability. So basically. Uh, after you've declared him as attacker, you pay the boast cost, and then some sort of an effect triggers. Varagoth here lets you search your library for a card and put that card on top of your deck, which is really strong. Fearless Pup gets plus two, plus zero until end of turn, etc., uh, etc. Et different uh, cards have different boast costs, but basically, uh, declare as an attacker, you can then pay the boast cost any time until end of turn and uh, get some sort of a beneficial effect for that. Next we have Changeling, and again, I don't know if this is a set-specific ability. This is kind of, sort of, uh, evergreen-ish. Uh, it goes hand-in-hand -hand with the shapeshifter creature type, but basically a, change, uh, a creature with Changeling is simultaneously all creatures at once, uh, or all creature types, I should say, at once. So if you're building an, uh, say, like a dinosaur deck, and you want to have more dinosaurs, but there's not very many dinosaurs in the set, well, shapeshifters are all considered dinosaurs. If you're building an elf deck, Realmwalker is a staple in historic elf decks uh, because it is still an elf itself, and it allows you to cast elves off the top of your deck. Uh, so that's, that's Changeling. It is simultaneously all creature types at once. Uh, also very good in party decks, if you're uh, doing that kind of stuff, where you care about having clerics, wizards, warriors, and uh, rogues. So, that's Changeling. Next we have Fortell, and Fortell is again from Kaldheim. Fortell means that during your turn, at sorcery speed, you can pay two generic mana to foretell the card. It then goes into exile, and you can cast it again uh, you, you can then cast it for its foretell cost. Uh, 
Uh, and often that's just a discount, uh, but sometimes it gets an extra effect uh, when you foretell it. So like, for example, if we look at Doomscar, this is normally a five mana board wipe, but you can foretell it on turn two and then play it on turn three for its foretell cost. So you can essentially wipe the board as early as turn three if you need to with foretell, which is very strong. Um, there are other ones as well. Uh, Haunting Voyage, for example, has a foretell. Uh, I mean, the foretell cost, the, the cost that you have to pay to foretell a, co uh, a card is always two to actually like put it into exile. But then to cast it from exile, um, that's it's, it's kind of weird describing foretell cost. But anyway, if we look at Haunting Voyage, if you foretell Haunting Voyage, you get to get all creature types of the type you choose from your graveyard instead of just two creatures. So sometimes the foretell uh, effect is better, but usually it's just a dis sort of a way to sort of um, pay the mana cost in installments, if you think of it that way, like Doomscar. Uh, I should also probably mention foretelling a card, uh, you can't cast it on the same turn that you foretell it. You can cast it on the following turn during your opponent's turn, but you can't cast it on the same turn. So you can't foretell a card and then cast it right away. Uh, so that's Coldheim. Moving on to Strixhaven, we have Crew. And this is another uh, keyword that we have seen many times before, but this goes with vehicle cards, and Crew means that you can tap uh, any number of creatures you control with total power equal to the crew cost or more. So this Raider's Carve has a crew cost of three. That means you would need to tap creatures with power three or greater. This Essica's Chariot has a crew cost of four. That means you need to tap creatures with total power four or greater, etc. What then happens is the vehicle then turns into a creature until the end of turn. So that's that's instead of being an artifact. That's crew. Uh, next, we have Learn, and Learn is kind of a, an interesting one. This is unique to called, or I'm sorry, this is unique to Strixhaven, I believe. When you learn, you can reveal a lesson card from outside the game, which in arena terms means from your sideboard, and put it into your hand. So there's a bunch of uh, Learn cards in Strixhaven. You can see them all here, and then you can go and essentially fetch lesson cards from your sideboard, uh, your sideboard, and put them into your hand. And there's a bunch of lesson cards as well. So it's a, kind of an interesting take on uh, tutor effects. I, I like it. It's sort of unique. Next, we have Magecraft. This is, again, Strixhaven. And Magecraft basically just says, whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, something happens. Prismari Pledge Mage can't be blocked. Uh, Symmetry Sage gets uh, gives target creature you control base power 2 until end of turn. Dragon's Guard Elite gets a plus 1, plus 1 counter. So it, it's going to be different with every creature, but Magecraft basically just says, whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, trigger an effect of some kind. Then we have Forgotten Realms, and Forgotten Realms is kind of an interesting one because there's a lot of abilities. Oh, <laughs> there's a lot of abilities that uh, don't actually do anything. Um, or at least nothing noteworthy. They're just sort of flavorful. So like, uh, what would be a good example? Here we go, White Dragon. Cold Breath it has as an ability, but this is the only creature with Cold Breath. So it's not really an ability we need to talk about. However, there are two of them that are reused multiple times. And the first one is Pack Tactics. And this is on red and green cards primarily. And it says, whenever you attack with total power six or greater, including the card that's attacking, uh, you trigger an effect. So Werewolf Pack Leader, if it attacks and you've attacked with total creatures power, uh, total power six or greater, you get to draw a card. Hobgoblin Captain gets first strike. Targnar gets, um, gives plus one, plus zero to all creatures that are attacking. Battlecry Goblin generates a goblin. That's pack tactics. Basically, if you're attacking with six total power or more, you trigger an effect. Next, we have Venture into the dungeon. And this is in basically all colors, I believe, from Forgotten Realms. But whenever you venture into the dungeon, you choose. When you do it for the first time, you choose a dungeon. And there are three 
dungeons to pick from. The Dungeon of the Mad Mage, the Lost Mind of, Fan, uh, of Fandelver, and the Tomb of Annihilation. So the first time you venture, you choose the dungeon, and you do the thing at the top of the dungeon card. So Tomb of Annihilation, each player loses one life. Dungeon of the Mad Mage, you gain a life. Lost Mine of Fandelver, you scry one, etc., etc. The next time you venture in the dungeon, you, uh, you advance in the dungeon that you picked. So say we chose the Lost Mine for the first one, we get to scry one the first time we venture. The second time we venture, we can choose to either create a 1-1 one, one goblin, goblin creature token, or we can create a treasure token. The time we venture after that, if we went into, if we did the goblin layer, the next time we venture afterwards, we can either put a plus one, plus one counter on a creature, or each opponent loses one life and you gain a life. So basically, you're, you're advancing your way through the dungeon. You pick a dungeon, you work your way through it each time you venture, uh, and then eventually you complete the dungeon. And once the dungeon has been completed, the next time you venture, you get to start over and choose a new dungeon, or you can choose the same one. So basically, just think of it this way. The first time you do it, you choose a dungeon, you work your way through that dungeon, and then you repeat the process. Each time you venture, uh, you advance your dungeon crawling in some way, shape, or form. So that's venture. Now we get into Midnight Hunt, the new and recent stuff. And the first one I want to look at is Coven, uh, which is in Midnight Hunt. Here we go. And Coven basically says at the beginning of your, uh, at the, or, well, it's not always end step. Coven basically says if you have three different creatures with different power, you get to take advantage of the effect. So, for example, Dual Craft Trainer, at the beginning of combat on your turn, if you control three or more creatures with different powers, and by powers it's talking about power toughness, not, not ability, uh, target creature you control gains double strike until end of turn. Sigarda here. Whenever Sigarda attacks, if you control three or more different creatures with different powers, look at the top five cards of your library, reveal a human, and put it into your hand. So basically, it's an ability that says, hey, we care about having different creatures with different power, you know, three different creatures uh, with different powers on the board, and then we get to take advantage of this effect, whatever it may be. So that's Coven. Next, we have Daybound and Nightbound, and these go hand in hand. Uh, basically, this is a new mechanic with Innistrad Midnight Hunt, and when a Daybound creature enters the battlefield, it becomes day. There are also other creatures that will say when this creature enters, there are some that will just trigger it but aren't actually daybound, nightbound. They just say like, um, hey, we, uh, we, we, we make it day when it becomes, uh, when we enter the battlefield. Uh, specifically, one example would be Sunrise Cavalier. If it's neither day nor night, it becomes day as Sunrise Cavalier enters the battlefield. So that essentially starts the cycle. Once it becomes day for the first time, you then track it for the rest of the game, or more accurately, Arena will track it for you, and it flips back and forth between day and night. And you can see, as it becomes day, transform all night ball, uh, nightbound permanents into their daybound side. If a player casts no spells during their own turn, it becomes night. On the flip side, night says if it becomes night, transform all daybound permanents into their nightbound side. Permanents that have Nightbound enter the battlefield Nightbound, and if a player casts at least two spells during their own turn, it becomes Day. So essentially, if we look at Werewolves, which is which is where this is uh, primarily found, Werewolf, uh, the typing is hard, Werewolf. Um, if we look at say um, the Bane Blade Scoundrel. If it is neither day nor night, if it hasn't, if the cycle hasn't started yet, it will enter on its daybound side. It then becomes day. Uh, if you don't cast any spells, or if the uh, if your opponent doesn't cast any spells on their turn, it then becomes night, and Bane Blade Scoundrel turns into Bane Claw Marauder. When a player then casts two spells on their turn, it flips back into Bane Blade Scoundrel. This is one of those abilities that you kind of have to see in action because describing it with words doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. But essentially the takeaway is with the, the day-night cycle starts, and then when it's day, stuff is on their day-bound side. When it's night, stuff is on their night-bound side. And the way that it flips back and forth is in order for it to become night, 
uh, a player casts no spells during their turn, and in order for it to become day, uh, a player casts two spells during their turn, and it flips back and forth. So that's Daybound Nightbound. Next we have Decayed, and this I don't believe is actually on any creatures itself, um, but this is for the new zombie tokens in Midnight Hunt. Uh, a creature with Decayed uh, gets sacrificed after it attacks. So if you attack with a Decayed zombie, uh, it will be sacrificed at the end of combat. That's what Decayed means. Uh, next, we have Flashback. This is, again, uh, a returning ability. Uh, and you know what? I'll probably mention Disturb here as well, because they're very similar. Disturb uh, says that when a creature dies, it ends up in the, the graveyard, and then you can cast it again for its Disturb cost, and it becomes its transformed side. So looking at Morning Patrol here, uh, the creature is normally a 2-mana two 2-3 two, with Vigilance. After it dies, it goes into the graveyard. You can then cast it again for 4-mana to turn it into Morning Apparition. Malevolent Hermit starts out as a 2-mana two 2-1. Two After it dies and ends up in the graveyard, you can cast it for 3-mana to turn it into Benevolent Geist. And then with all Disturbed Creatures, after they die a second time, after their Transformed side dies they get exiled instead of going back into the graveyard again. Uh, kind of tagging along with that, we have Flashback, which basically just says you can cast the card from your graveyard again for its flashback cost, but it doesn't transform into anything. That's the difference. Uh, so basically, you just get to cast the card a second time. If we look at Homestead Courage, one mana for a plus one, plus one counter and give it Vigilance until end of turn, and then you can do it again uh, a second time. So that's flashback, uh, and then after you do it the second time, it gets exiled. Uh, so you can't just repeatedly play it forever over and over and over again from the graveyard. So that's basically all the abilities. I still want to touch on a couple of very specific sort of important keywords that you should probably know if you are a new Magic player. The first one is destroy, and destroy means send it from the graveyard, or, or send it from the battlefield to the graveyard. You kill the creature, you send it from the battlefield to the graveyard. That's destroy. Uh, equip, you'll find on equipment spells. <coughs> Excuse me. I guess this is technically an ability. You pay the cost next to the equip word, and then you can put it onto one of your creatures at sorcery speed. So in order to equip the plus two mace onto one of your creatures, you pay three mana at sorcery speed, and then you can put it on there. You can then pay three mana again and put it on a different creature if you want. That's a quip. Next, we have Exile. Exile means remove from the game entirely. It doesn't go into the battlefield. It doesn't go back into your deck. It is removed from the game. Uh, and I think there are technically a couple cards that will allow you to get stuff back from Exile, but they are very few and far between. Uh, so generally, when you Exile something, it is gone for good. Uh, then we have Mill. You will see this. Uh, each opponent mills eight cards or mills three cards. That means you put that many cards from the top of your deck into your graveyard. So mill, pretty straightforward. We have scry as well. Scry means you look at that many cards, and then you can either put them uh, on the bottom of your deck or uh, or back on top in any order. So if you scry, one, say for... Silver Raven, you scry one. Basically, when it enters the battlefield, you get to look at the top card of your deck, you can decide if it's useful, and then you can either put it back on top of your deck, or you can put it on the bottom of your deck. Uh, so it's a way to sort of filter cards. If you have scry two, you would look at the top two cards of your deck. You could then put them back in any order, or you can decide these are both junk, I want to put them both on the bottom of my library, or maybe you decide one of these is good and the other one is terrible, so I'll put one back on top and one on the bottom. That's Scry. Very similar to Scry is Surveil, which isn't technically in this. <laughs> uh, it's not an evergreen keyword, although they should really just make it uh, one. <laughs> uh, so if we look at uh, what's a good example here? Um, here we go. Consider. 
look at the top card of your library, you may put that card into your graveyard. So it's basically the same as Scry, except instead of having the opportunity to put it on the bottom of your deck, you would put it into your graveyard instead. That's Surveil. It's technically not a keyword, but it is from older sets, and people will call it Surveil. And we have Snow Mana. Um, you will see on certain cards a little symbol that looks like this. That's probably a bad example, because I've got a special card thing for that one. Uh, let's just look at Faceless Haven. Here we go. So Faceless Haven, you can see this little sort of snow symbol right here. That means snow mana. You have to pay for it with snow mana, and you get snow mana from snow lands, um, such as snow-covered plains, snow-covered islands, the dual lands like Volatile Fjord or Snowfield Sinkhole. That's snow mana. Then we have target, and target is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, if an effect targets something, you are choosing the object of that effect. So tap target creature, you choose which creature is being tapped. This is relevant because certain card, if, if an effect targets something, it will almost always say that it targets something, and it's relevant for stuff like Hexproof and Ward that we talked about earlier that say uh, they can't be targeted or you have to pay an, an additional effect when targeting. Uh, finally, we have Transform, and this just means that cards with one side transform into their backside. These are double-sided cards. There's a bunch of them, especially now that we have Midnight Hunt out, um, and they have two sides, their normal side that they normally enter the battlefield on, and then their transformed side, and uh, transform just means you flip it to the backside of the card and it becomes the other one. So yeah, I know it's a lot of information and it's a lot of stuff. Keep in mind, you can Google most of this stuff. You can look up stuff on the wiki uh, for Magic. There's a ton of information out there uh, for, you know, Magic the Gathering. It's a very old game with a lot of complexity, but there's also a lot of resources to help you learn it. Hopefully you found this beneficial. If you enjoyed the video, you know what to do. Links in the description below, so check that out as well. Also, if you have any questions or anything uh, that I didn't answer, feel free to put it in the comments and I will do my best to, uh, to help you out. Uh, but yeah, other than that, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.